you know it's a good DevOps conference when you hear the word DevOps like every like like ten times a minute, right? Like, right? Like it's it's a good DevOps conference, isn't it? Is everybody enjoying themselves? Yep. Yep. Let's let's get that energy up, guys. Let's get. A, we're going to talk about on call, and I know on call is a very terrible thing. Who's been on call here before? Who's been on call? Yeah, a lot of people been on call. Who hates on call? Yeah. There you go. There you go. That guy. That guy doesn't like hate on call. That guy. That guy loves it. He's like, he's like, I want to be on call, please. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> cool. So my name is Sergio Yusuf. As you can see, I'm a product manager at Daydog. So I pretend to know all the technical stuff uh, around on call. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I've been. Uh, I've been in the incident space. I've been in the on call space for quite a while. Daydog itself is, of course, not an on call product. But uh, you know, like we're we we have, as you can imagine. In our teams, we have to manage high availability, right? Because a lot of uh, a lot of people rely on us for metrics, uh, very crucial metrics, logs and traces, uh, very crucial insights. So our on-call teams uh, are always, uh, you know, performing around the clock. And uh, even before this, uh, I was uh, working in Atlas and Ops Genie, which is actually an on-call product. And so I've been in this space for quite a while, and I've seen. Quite a bit of stuff going on in this space. Unfortunately, what I've also seen is that there's also a lack of innovation in the way we actually think about the on-call culture, right? So you see all of these fancy tools. You see, like you know, proprietary tools. You see on uh, open-source tools, but you actually don't see a shift in the culture that much. Meaning that on-call, no matter what fancy UI you have, somebody's still going to wake up at three o'clock at night and going to be really pissed off, right? So hopefully today we will. Kind of mitigate that pain point, right? So you know, when we look at on-call, we need to think about like you know, the first. Let's look at the effects of on-call. Let's look, at, and then like we need to think about the human aspect of on-call, the people who are actually on the front lines performing on-call, the technical aspect of on-call. What happens if you don't actually have a good on-call practice? What happens to your systems? Um, you know, and then we need to think about like how we can deconstruct it and reconstruct it, so that. We are a bit more human approach. We have a bit more of a human approach to make sure that on call is less sucky. All right. Um, so if we look at the effects of on call, right, there's actually been a lot of research done about this, right? Uh, you know, like for example, like um, and, I'm, and I may be mispronouncing the names, but uh, there's actually been quite a bit of academic research done around this. For example, like there's a academician, uh, Carla M. Zeberts and her, and team. Uh, they released. A research paper around this uh, called the relationship of on-call work with fatigue, work-home interference, and perceived performance difficulties, and it was published in Biomed Research International Journal. Right, uh, and there's also some some other papers that have been written by, um, uh, you know, like Dan Dimiters uh, and their their team. Again, these are all academicians um, in like one of some of the most prestigious universities. But basically, what they saw was that being on call is very stressful, right? It doesn't matter whether you receive incidents or not. It doesn't matter whether you receive alerts. Just the fact that you're walking around in the family picnic with your laptop is really stressful, right? It's true. It's true. Like, uh, and what we realized, what what all of this research showed was like it uh, that cortisol levels were increasing, right? Uh, like and like cortisol, uh, cortisol levels are you know attributed to like higher blood pressure and uh, you know and heart disease and this and that. So being on call is literally killing you, right? Literally, like uh, yeah. Like, and uh, if you if you folks aren't being compensated for that, then uh, you know. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it's it's terrible. It's actually terrible. We 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 don't realize the side effects. And especially imagine you you know when you're a new intern, you really want to try to prove yourself. And you decide that you know, or when you're new in your job and you want to try to prove yourself, I've done this. I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to be on call. I'm going to take. I'm going to override. You know, oh, you need to go for that family function. I'm going to override it. But then it turns out that it's really shit, right? And like you burn out very easily. So let's talk about like how we can get from that guy to that guy, because I want to be that guy, right? Uh, I mean, I like afternoon naps also, but in on my sofa, <laughs> right? Um, so basically, we need to think about like how we're torn between the human aspects and the technical aspects. And and you already have all these metrics to measure that, right? You have 
things like uh, from the human metrics, you can actually measure alerts per uh, on-call personnel, right? You can measure things like uh, how many off hours did the on-call person uh, work and the escalation rate. So escalation rate is actually very interesting. I, I really like this escalation rate metric. What it basically is, and like if you aren't measuring it already in your teams, I really, I highly do recommend you do measure it. And es escalation is basically like, did the first responder manage to solve this incident, uh, pardon me, or this alert, or respond to this alert? Or did it have to actually get, you know, to, did you actually have to ping your second level, your L2 uh, responders? Uh, why was that? Was it because you couldn't, um, resp was it because they were just not available or they, or they just couldn't respond to it? So, uh, you know, like, of people who have, a, like, teams that have a very high escalation rate, what we see is that they are teams that probably don't have a very good on-call setup, right? Because you're like, constantly escalating it to somebody. Um, that, that being said, that does not mean necessarily that escalations are a bad thing, right? Uh, maybe you just don't have the subject matter expert and you do need to escalate it. You should definitely escalate things, if it, especially if, it's, if, if the problem is affecting our customer. And then we are all very familiar with this system metric. And selfishly, for a very long time, on-call uh, culture has been around improving these uh, metrics. In fact, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, OK. Uh, in fact, uh, like, you know, we, we, talk, we already know about MTTR, MTTA, uptime, availability. These are all those DevOps metrics, right? But, and you can see like, how focused we are on that. We always hear about that, but we, know, we rarely, very rarely hear about those other metrics, right? And so, uh, oops, what's going on? Uh, the, the pointer isn't working anymore. Apologies. We have our on-call guy over here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, try now? Yeah, OK. So if you, yeah. so if you actually think about uh, what constitutes as an alert or when sh somebody should be woken up, you know, we are ingesting all of these events from our monitoring apparatus, right? We have all of these events coming in. But not all of these events are alerts. Some of, them, some of these events are probably change events, like deployments or config changes. That's all right. That's all right. But you should still be monitoring them. And we'll get to why you should still be monitoring them. Right? Uh, then some of those are actually alerts. But maybe they're not important alerts. Maybe they're not uh, you know, crucial alerts. So they don't constitute as major incidents. And then finally, you have your incident process. Right? Uh, and so you go from like you know, from your monitoring apparatus to your on-call setup to your incident response, right? And the, and the reason why you need to think about all of these systems is because, the, is because when we think about like what the effect of on-call is, which is, it's very stressful, we want to make sure that all of these things, all of these three components are set up in a way that reduce the stress. The, the key over here to making on-call less sucky is basically reducing the stress that somebody feels when they're on call. That is our goal, right? And, and, um, and that's what we want to achieve. And to do that, we need to ensure that these three components are geared in such a way that they don't only improve the system metrics that we saw in the previous slide, but also the human metrics that we'll see. And we'll see how all of these uh, components are actually uh, related. So let's now deconstruct what an alert or a alert response, uh, what a response should be, right? So as we already said, we are ingesting all of these events. We must create that alert. But that creation, what that creation, alert creation means is that you, we want to enrich that alert with information, right? And we want to actually decide when that event needs to be an alert. And then you need to route that alert uh, or associate that alert. That, uh, I must apologize, that may be a bit uh, misleading. Alert routing doesn't necessarily mean like sending the alert to the right person, but basically associating the alert with the right team or right service, right? And then finally, based on the, how you associated that alert to the right team and the right service, you want to uh, page, uh, you know, you want to go to your on-call schedule, then you set up your on-call schedule, and that's where the human aspect will really come into the picture. And then you have your page notification, which is basically your notification channels, all right? And what we see over here is that if we go 
further. So let's let's think of our. We have like this system, right? We have this uh, distributed. We have like the, a bunch of microservices. We have service A, B, C. They're managed by teams, right? But you see, it's not it's not as simple as this. Like you, you don't always have one-to-one -one dependencies on services to teams, right? You can have like one-to-one. -one, okay, that's per, that's like the ideal scenario. So it's very easy that if you associate this event to this service, then that team who's managing that service needs to get paged. But then you also have scenarios like one-to-n service associations, or n-to-one, or n-n-n-to-n, right? And why is that? Like, for example, let's say you have a you have service A, right? Or, or let's say you have service B, right? And service B is being built by team two, right? But you may get a security alert on service uh, B, and the, and the security team is uh, team three, which then needs to respond to that alert. So how do you know which team needs to respond to an alert on team B, right? Uh, on service B, pardon me. So. What we can start doing is then we can start first, you know, as we ingested those events, we can start group, uh, grouping those events and associating those events, right? So, uh, and you can do this through, uh, like, so, you know, you, you have a lot of CMDB tools out there. You have a lot of uh, monitoring tools that, uh, ha you know, allow, to, allow you to uh, manage tags and stuff like that. And that's, a, that's all a way to, uh, you know, group your alerts and, like, associate your alerts to the right place. But here, what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm seriously just talking about this theoretically. Okay, try to perform this, regardless of whichever tool you're using or whatever, or whatever uh, practice you're using. Do try to achieve something like this. Try to group events together. Try to group like events together, all right? And then start associating these events uh, to your services and uh, to your teams, right? Because it's very important that this happens from the beginning. It's very important that we start building this stuff from the beginning, right? Um, what we have seen previously is that if we go back to the previous slide, people don't really uh, associate alert routing and alert creation and event ingestion to the responding, right? So that means like when you would get a message, uh, when you would get alert, you would be like, oh, what, what, what's, there's, no, there's no enrichment. It's like, what, what, what is this alert about, you know? So try to do that. Next, we'll, we have that grouping mechanism. We try to bring, we try to start telling a story. All right. Try to start telling a story. What is the story that I'm talking about? For example, let's say uh, you get a um, uh, you know a malicious IP, uh, you know a DDoS attack, and also one of your hosts are experiencing a, a high CPU usage. Those two things could be related. Those two things could be related, and if you could group those things together, you can start telling those stories. And again, it doesn't matter which tool you're using, or what type of tool it is, or what practices you have. Try to start building your systems and try to start, uh, you know, uh, setting up your monitoring apparatus in a way that starts allowing for this, right? Uh, if we keep on going forward, then what we need to do, as I said, we have the groups, and then we need to start thinking about the routing rules. And the routing rules is like, remember how in the previous example, like if you have a security alert and if you have an infrastructure alert, which teams need to get notified when, right? Don't just Send one, don't just have one single team to respond to something, because what that means is that then uh, that those people who are probably getting all of these uh, alerts are not subject matter experts in those alerts, and so there would always be stress. People would always be stressed when getting something that they're, they aren't aware about, right? Finally, uh, you know, we'll let's also, and now finally, after the alert routing stuff, now we can actually start building our on-call schedules on these teams. And when you're thinking about the on-call schedules, now, you know, because we have already, like, we, 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 we started off with this human approach that we want to make those alerts coming in as enriched, as informative as possible. So we've already, like, uh, in, you know, instilled a lot of trust over there, uh, and a lot of information. Let's also, like, make sure that when we are setting up our on-call schedules, we, we follow a very human approach. Right? Like, let's, you know, like, uh, if, uh, you, you, let's think about fairness models, and let's leave fairness models up to teams to decide. If I went out for a holiday and somebody took my position, do I come back and do more on call? Or is it okay? Maybe, right? What does a fairness model look for your team? Let the teams decide, because each team has its own culture, right? And then we need to start thinking about escalation policies. And this is where escalation policies, you need to ensure that escalation policies are set up in a way that you never miss an alert because we, as we are like, you know, setting up, as we're thinking about the human approach, we still need to maintain and not sacrifice the technical approach of things, right? We, so we need to balance both the technical approach and the uh, human approach over here. So 
what we have seen is that when you think about escalation policies, think about escalation policies on how critical the service is. Maybe some services are just not that critical. Maybe they're not, you know, they, can, they have a more um, tolerance to uh, downtime. And so set up your escalation policies accordingly. You know, have greater times between the escalations. But maybe you have some services like that are so critical that you need, you know, um, more, uh, you know, more shorter escalation uh, times, you know. So think of escalation policies from a service perspective, from an individual service perspective, and think about on-call schedules from a human perspective, all right? Finally, uh, well, automate everything. And I think that is a key saying in DevOps, right? Try, let's try to automate everything, right? And no, when we try to automate everything, is we're trying to automate everything because not only are we already trying to share the responsibility amongst team one, team two, team three, but we're also trying to share a lot of responsibility to auto-remediation. We're trying to lean on auto-remediation, right? Don't directly wake somebody up at three o'clock at night. See if you have some self-healing mechanisms that can do that. Invest in automation tools, right? In, uh, you know, we, we saw uh, some uh, great talks about uh, Captain, uh, just uh, the talk before the last talk. It's, uh, think of these tools. Think of these automation tools, right? Uh, and uh, so think about grouping. Uh, think about automation in grouping. Think about automation in routing. And think about automation in remediation. And also think about automation in investigation, right? If you know if this service goes down, go and go directly and automate pulling in all the metrics and all the dashboards and all the insights that you need and putting them in a single report, right? And finally. So that was like, you know, and once we finally construct that, we, we have basically reconstructed a model that instills trust, that um, reduces the responsibility and so reduces the stress, divides that responsibility amongst the experts, and also helps, and through automation, again, reduces that stress. There, so that's the uh, a reconstructed model, but let's also think about other things that we can do, right? Let's think about conducting war games, making sure that we're always prepared, making sure that each, like in Datadog, we, every month we review all incidents, regardless of which priority that was. Because different people, people of different levels are, you know, um, are going to be responding to incidents, maybe some experts, maybe some junior engineers. So it's, it's always beneficial. You know, maintain runbooks, document everything. I know it's stress, it's, it sucks, right? Like, you, you didn't go to, uh, you didn't do four years of a computer science degree just to write documentation, right? But we gotta do it, we gotta do it, you know? As I said, automate response, think about your escalation paths, think about one-click actions. Like, you know, if you see a malicious IP, have a one-click action somewhere where you can directly block that malicious IP, right? Uh, ensure post-mortem, like do practice post-mortem culture. Again, most of the on-call tooling that is out there today uh, he is heavily investing in uh, post-mortem culture, right? Create transparency and also make sure that there's a blameless culture. Because if you don't have a, that blameless culture, then people will be very scared and very stressful to be on call. It just makes on-call more sucky. And of course, compensate well. Like, nobody wants to wake up at three o'clock at night. You shouldn't, if you are, Make sure you're compensated. And uh, that's my time. I hope you folks uh, learned something. Thank you so much.